OFA podcast viewers and listeners, welcome back to another special edition of our recordings here with the Oakville Festivals in Film and Art, following up with some of our favorite titles from the 2023 Oakville Film Festival. My name is Tyler Collins. I'm one of the arts reporters for Oakville News and one of the hosts for the Oakville Festivals in Film and Art. We are here with the final episode of our series from this year's fabulous feature films, and I am joined this morning by two very special guests from the OFA Best Canadian Film and Best Director winning movie, Blackberry. This was our best sold and most talked about movie of the entire year, and so there is no better film to be the final subject of our episodes today. We are joined now by two gentlemen who worked very hard on the movie. First, if you were at our screening back in the summer, you'll remember us having Matt Miller, who is the producer and co-writer on the film. He's joining us again today. And also joining us is the director, co-writer, and he played Doug in the movie, Matt Johnson. Hi, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for this final episode of the year, guys. Thanks Hello. For- thank you. Now, both of you guys, you must have had a, had a roller coaster 2023. Uh, it was almost a year ago now that BlackBerry first premiered in Berlin. And what a release it has had in the time since. Uh, what has the experience been like for the two of you going around the entire world sharing this story with so many people? It's been really wonderful and and quite remarkable to see the interest in um, what we thought was a very small Canadian story. Um, and, and and using the analogy of a roller coaster, I think implies that there were like low moments, um, but uh, but really those happened it, during the making of the movie. Yeah, the ro- the roll the roller coaster was creating the movie. Uh, but since then, the reception has been way outsized beyond our expectations to a, to a huge degree. And uh, and I would say to to a, a Canadian and specifically to a Canadian film festival like you guys, it, it's probably interesting to hear that the number one piece of feedback that I get in other countries about the film is that people truly had no idea that this was a Canadian product or a Canadian story. Like no idea. And I would say that that's resoundingly wow. been one of the large um, successes of the movie for, for me personally. Anyway, is I think in some in some ways living in Canada, we're in a kind of maybe a bubble, thinking that oh well, everybody must know Blackberry is Canadian because it's basically the only product our country's ever made that has had a global impact, and uh, and so we must have a reputation for this, and to see that that we don't. And that this film has done something to uh, remedy that has been way, way more gratifying than I thought it would have been. How has it been gratifying for you, uh, Matt Johnson? Well, I mean, sorry, as I just Matt, said. Sorry, Matt Miller. I'm sorry. Uh, well, you know. I, to all of um, our viewers and listeners, as both of our guests are Matt, I have been batting pretty much zero this entire recording session referencing the correct mats today. So please forgive me in advance. <laughs> That's a good Mr. Miller, tell us. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, again, it's, it's kind of been thrilling. You, we, we've made a bunch of stuff over the years and you work really hard and you put it out into the world and then you kind of go and you start to do it again. And the way people respond to it, you can never really anticipate. And we certainly didn't think that um, it would sort of appeal to as broad an audience as it did and to as many people and to as many people in an older demographic, like just things that we were not thinking about while we were making it. And so that was really um, exciting and uh, and gratifying just to see that, you know, it was pretty much a, a resounding uh, positive response uh, from viewers. So um, we, we'd never really experienced that um, on as broad a level before. Um, so that was a lot of fun. One thing I would love to hear from both of you, because uh, you guys worked very closely on this project, both as co-writers, producing, and and in the trenches, so to speak, making the movie, and now turned into the series. Um, I would love to know from each of you, what was a notable contribution or a favorite part that the other person did? So Miller, what is something Johnson brought that you really loved? And Johnson, what's something Miller brought that you really enjoyed? Well, you know, Johnson wore that blue bandana. I guess it wasn't the blue one. You wore the orange one mostly. And in the movie? In the movie. Let me let me let me go get it. And oh my gosh, you have it? That's fantastic. 
And he really is the only person who could pull off that look. You know, it was funny. I remember when the trailer for Dumb Money came out, which came out a couple of months after yeah. our movie, Paul Dano's wearing the headband. And I'm like, oh, they took that from us. They they took that from us. You uh, here first, folks. Dumb Money stole the headband idea. <laughs> Canonically true, indisputed. Uh, yeah, right. But um, it was, yeah, as I said, Matt's contribution, I think his major contribution to the movie was the headband because the headband was actually not part of um, the origin story of Rim. And uh, and that was something he felt passionate about. Yeah, that was a uh, sartorial um, migration from my own life. And for some reason, we were looking for a indicator or a symbol of, you know, arrested development, but also a like when I was young, uh, a, a, a memory that really stands out for me um, was take your kid to work day. And my dad having, I, I had long hair as a, as a, as a young person, I think in grade nine, this was, mm -hmm. and I wasn't allowed to, I had to dress up and wear a suit, et cetera, et cetera, to go into work. And I was so put off by this. And I thought, Oh, when I grow up, Whatever I do, I'm not going to have to wear a, a uniform or an outfit. And so I think that my character wearing a headband and sort of dressing so um, so childishly, you know, wearing wearing um, movie T-shirts, et cetera, was his way of saying, yeah, this is a job, but it's a job where we make the rules and the kids make the rules. And so it was... Uh, yeah, a useful symbol in that way. But I have a much more interesting comment to make about Matt Miller's contribution to the film. Hmm. And I'm going I'm to... Uh, it, well, it's only been a few seconds since I began answering the question. So you're, uh, um, I want to think of something really fundamental in the script or a piece of dialogue that I love. I, I remember one of, the early, one of the big contributions you had in the script, we wound up cutting stupidly of of jim of uh jim offering all the salesmen that money that story that you'd taken from uh that basketball Doc, coach Doc rivers the Doc rivers celtics yeah that was a and fun that, yeah and that was a real favorite in the in the movie that that we that we cut out and that's always what i thought oh yeah thank god we have that moment um in the movie um <sighs> So my greatest well, contribution, Tyler. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, of course, it's the wrong, the wrong, the wrong story to start on. It's just that it was my favorite, yeah. and and it's so sad that it got taken away. No, um, but if you hadn't told us just now, we we the audience would have never known it existed. It, well, yeah, of course. I I, I think that um, generally the the whole movie exists because of Miller, um, and so because he was really the person in charge of, of everything, but that's such a boring answer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of, um, uh, of like, like a specific funny thing that people would not attribute to him that, that, that is in the script. I remember much of that Google scene where um, Jim is going to recruit uh, Rich Summer. A lot of that was Miller's idea and how that scene comes together. That's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Um, I here while you're thinking, I've got another question for you, Miller. Um, w one of the things that I love most about the script that you guys made was how funny it is, uh, and it could have been very easy to make this very serial focused, concentrated like it is, but also to make it really grim. And you guys brought a lot of humor injected into this why was that so important to the success of telling the blackberry story well i think <clears throat> i think we think everything's funny i think that's an outlook that we share everything has comedy in it the darkest moments of life people laugh at funerals you know and so like i think if you if this movie i think we knew from the get-go that this movie had to be funny because the the term blackberry is kind of a punchline in our country right um at least it what it certainly was before this movie was made I, I don't know what people are thinking now who've seen it but um like we thought of them as a as a joke 
And what was crazy to Johnson and I, as we read the book that the script is based on, is how, like, we didn't invent stuff, right? Like, the, the like a lot of the funny stuff that happens where it's just like, oh, this didn't really happen. But it's like, they really left that prototype in the back of the taxi cab, right? Which isn't like, haha, funny. Um, but the way you choose to execute that is haha, funny, right? And the way you have Jay running into the room or, you know, again, stuff that we left in, him burping in the middle of the monologue when he's explaining what's going on. Like, that's just stuff that we like. Um, and we're always looking for like th the mistakes and the things that, that didn't go according to plan because that's what gets us excited. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Justin? I realize what your by far biggest contribution to the movie is. It was oh, casting that. Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I have to show that the, a little I, bit. It was the idea. It was the idea to put Glenn in the movie as Jim, uh, because I didn't. I never watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia before. And Miller, early on, very early, was like, "I know who should play this guy," and uh, and I would say. Almost unequivocally, that's that's one of the most important decisions that was made in this film. Uh, but in terms of the question of comedy, I guess it's somewhat interrelated, which is that that uh, all of our movies have a combination of sort of comedy and tragedy. Um, and it's because they're sort of about, you know, dreamers who try to create their own reality and then at some point are met with um, with. Um, with literal reality. And that's always a, a kind of sad collision between those two things. And it's funny to watch people who believe they can do impossible things um, before they've done it because they seem so silly and so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but at least in this case, I it, it, it think one of the useful messages of the Blackberry story is that it takes a certain kind of, I don't want to call it idiocy, but uh, naivety, almost childish, optimism to do anything difficult and when you see that group of young engineers at the beginning of the film in the 90s you think well there's no way these guys are going to accomplish anything in their lives it's it's it just is inconceivable they're too disorganized and and uh and they have no discipline and yet through one small contextual shift which is that all of a sudden they're being pushed by a kind of maniacal a type businessman, they're actually able to do an impossible thing that that pivots the world, um, and I think that 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 really is true. That uh, oftentimes it's a mix of childish optimism and and work ethic that that, can, that creates um, uh, well things that that really do seem impossible, and that is a combination of of something that's quite funny and quite tragic, just by definition. I think one of the great things you're highlighting here is is how the contrast is so satisfying to watch between the the heavy business and the silliness of in their behaviors. And contrast is always such a great and exciting thing to watch on camera. And you guys captured that magnificently. Um, mm. I thought that was I thought it looked brilliant. The final product is so filled with these drastic opposites, and that's part of what makes it so exciting to watch. Um, what, one of the experiences I had when I was in the audience, the first time I went to, I saw the movie, uh, about a month before we had it at the film festival. And I watched it with my dad who has worked in finance his whole life. And he owned at some point in his time, several versions of the Blackberry and had the addiction that you guys showed that so many people had. Um, I'm curious to know what, what is some of the response been like? from not just the subjects of the story, but of the people who lived through this as consumers now reliving these experiences. It's oftentimes we're hearing stories about people who, who really are coming to the movie and because they love the product and we did not think that that was gonna happen. Um, uh, but I think because for Miller and I, me more so, but Miller as well, we didn't really have a, 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 a relationship with the product. I think we were both kind of too young to really be like, ah, yes, I use this phone all the time and I really love it. Um, and, and so it's been interesting to see a lot of fans of the film or people excited in the movie because they were excited about the product 
which I guess it was a naive uh, uh, thing for us to overlook as we were making the film. But um, but that's certainly been a, a good percentage of people who want to talk about the movie are people who want to talk about it from the perspective of having a nostalgic relationship with the product that they so miss. Which the other is so, big... so weird. Like, it's such a weird, like these people coming up to us at screenings holding blackberries, being like, I brought mine. Mm-hmm. thinking like, that we also are big fans of the product yeah but it's just so weird because even like it you know i can't imagine let's say they make the iphone movie i guess they already kind of did but they make another one in 20 years you know and i take this with me and i'm like ah yes i'm going to this movie so i must it, it's just so strange to me right it's like wait, you're not gonna get this autographed you're not waving this around like you're a fan go team like <laughs> you know and it, it was but I do think it was like, oh, people were like, oh, I'm going to this movie. And then they rummage through the drawer that we all have with our old tech and stuff. Right. And they're like, oh, I'm going to bring this. And it, again, the number of Blackberries, like the, just this motion, it was like my spring was this, you know, just constantly. I, I am sorry for you guys. That sounds like a very strange way to roll out a movie. <laughs> Uh, we're... Well, look, this was a, that was a small percentage of, of people we met, and at a certain level, it uh, it was kind of nice because typically the people who uh, were very very into it as a product were normally engineering types or like collector types, and uh, they all had uh, I would say very unique personalities. It was it was fun to meet a lot of those people. I'm getting one of the notes running tech for us today is our OFA executive director Wendy Donnan, and she was just messaging. Uh, as we're recording this, saying, I still have my BlackBerry, and hers still works. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I think that's wild that there are still people actively using these devices today. That's such a a, a crazy concept to me. Yeah, Um, large corners of the internet where where people are just uh, sharing intel on how to get old BlackBerry devices working on modern networks. Wow. Um, So one of the things that made this project so unique was that it was conceived simultaneously to be both a movie and a miniseries. And the movie came first, and that's how I think a lot of people got to see it. But recently, uh, it came out in Canada on CBC and in the U.S. on AMC Plus mm-hmm. as a three-part miniseries. And my understanding is there's a couple small differences between the two. So w- what I'd like to know are two things. One, how has the reception been different or not been different as people are seeing it in different formats? And two, what are some of those differences that made it more effective as a movie or as a TV show? Uh, In terms of the reception, it's actually very difficult for us to gauge how people feel about the the series version of it because there's no film festival culture around it. So it's not like we're going and engaging with audiences. We're not going to see people or do Q and A's or anything like that. So we we have just sort of an anecdotal idea of the response of the series and that's just if people would stop us and say oh i saw the series here's what i thought so so really we only have a, a concept of the response to the film and in terms of the differences we we tried to make the limited series a um we had we shot so much like like the, the the movie we shot for so long and we shot so much content and we cut so much of that out uh, for the film to try to get it uh, to a runtime that was under two hours that we were able to restore a lot of missing storylines and uh, fill in especially around uh, Mike and Jim's character a lot of backstory that wasn't in the film and specifically we were trying to do a kind of revisiting of the same moment over and over again over all three episodes and each episode is it takes place completely in in a in its own time period whether it's the 90s the early 2000s or the or the mid 2000s so it 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 broke out pretty easily when when we turned it into a series now miller you were telling me that 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 was a lot of the reasoning for the three-act structure of the movie was so it could be turned into these episodes but w- was there any accidental benefits you guys discovered in, in the writing and the shooting of it because of this format? Honestly, I don't think so. You know, mm-hmm. other than sort of being like, let's tell three ver- three three episodes of this story. Um, okay. it, you know, some like pacing and timing things. There used to be a, 
a big moment in the sort of in the middle of the film and around uh, 9-11 um, that the book delved into in, in great detail because 9-11 was really important to RIM's growth and development because basically after that their phones worked when all the cell towers went down on 9-11. So it became a very interesting tool in Washington. And, you know, the Senate was mandating everybody needed these things. And so it was a real business opportunity for them. And again, we had like a 15 minute uh, kind of chapter about that right in the middle of the film. And um, and we eventually cut it from the from the screenplay. Like we, we never shot that stuff. And, you know, again, looking at the series was like, well, that never would have fit in there either. So you know, getting to build in commercial breaks and stuff like that in the series. But, you know, we always knew they were going to be fairly similar and that there would probably be a couple deleted scenes and some stuff we really liked that we took out of the movie for pacing issue that we kind of got to resurrect and uh, and bring back to life in the series. So, Tyler, I need to jump off um, and, and jump on this other call, but thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for making the time to do this uh, again for us, uh, Miller. It was wonderful to see you again. I hope you have some wonderful holidays. Thanks so much for thank being you. part of this. You too, guys. Thanks, Ophel. We we are almost out of time, uh, Matt Johnson. But before we go, I, I have two more quick things for you. Number one, I was learning just before this recording, you have a small Oakville connection because you grew up right on the Mississauga border. Uh <laughs> Yeah, my, my mom was a doctor at Credit Valley Hospital, and uh, I, we moved from Toronto to, uh, to Winston Churchill when I was uh, around six years old. And so I spent a lot of my time, the, my first time going to movies by myself was at the Silver City. Um, on Vega is, Boulevard? Yeah, on Vega Boulevard. That's where I saw like the Big Lebowski, uh, like oh, all the movies that I would go see by myself. I would rollerblade there. Um, either by myself or with friends and see movies. And I would see movies constantly at that theater or at what used to be the, um, the AMC. The AMC at, Winston Churchill. Yeah. Winston Churchill. I would, I would go to either, either of those all the time, all the time. I, I think that's so cool. Uh, when I was a child, I had the exact same movie going memories. It was that or the encore cinemas now film.ca. Uh, well, film.ca is interesting. I uh, I went to, I'd never been there ever, never even once as a, as a kid, but then we filmed an episode of our TV show there. And, uh, and I was uh, amazed to see that that place existed. That's an interesting cinema. It is, but it, it's evolved so well. They're actually now the, the host venue for the Oakville Festivals of Film and Art. So we oh, do good. monthly screenings there and that's where we screened Blackberry during the festival uh this past summer well that's wonderful if it's still uh owned by the same guy he was quite a character and uh and uh a real lover of of, of movies so uh, oakville's lucky to have that place before we go i have one final question i would love to know um this has resonated so deeply with millions of people around the world and it has to be just an overwhelming experience for you as a creative person is there any part of the experience, either from your shooting, releasing, or sharing of the movie, that has been pers the most gratifying to you as an artist? And if so, what is it? Uh, I got to be honest, I don't really think in terms like that ever at all. And um, the release of work is, is sort of an afterthought um, compared to actually making them. And so all my memories, I would say my only positive memories uh of making anything that i've ever made uh, occur while we're editing and we solve narrative problems that i thought were going to be insurmountable and so i could share these things with you but they're so oh. bizarre and idiosyncratic and that's and all right in that case what is it about the editing and solving that narrative problem that's so satisfying for you that when i'm making anything I think of um, the person who made the film as as different than myself. I, I always think of him as a real idiot who screwed everything up. And I'm kind of at war with him in the same way that when I'm shooting movies, I think of the person who wrote the movie as like a complete moron who had no idea what he was doing, even though that's me as well. And so the different iterations of my own uh, personality then turning on one another and then conquering the things that the past me screwed up is like um, 
it, it's it's uh it's very uh, liberating and and I feel that those are the real uh, victories because it, then it's like I can right the past wrongs of myself um, by solving it later and and it, you know as I talk about it now I wonder if that is a is a problem like I probably should have just got it right when I was there but I'm much better at fixing things than um, than I am at uh, at preparing them correctly. I I think those are some of the words of a perfectionist at work. And yet, while nothing is ever perfect, you came pretty damn close with this. Um, mm. I think no, not it. really. I <laughs> I I can tell you, I was present in the screening we had this summer, we, and it was our best attended movie of the entire year. And the impression that you have left on audiences has such a resounding impact on how much not just they enjoyed it and how much they learned from it, but the contribution you've made to Canadian storytelling and culture, I think, has made has made a noise around the world. And so I think you should take great pride in what you've accomplished this year with BlackBerry. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> I, if that is one personal thing I can throw to you, um, I, that that's my impression, at least. And I'm sure that of many others who've had the the joy of getting to watch the movie and the series. Um, mm. We are over time, so I have, uh, I'm sorry for taking up a little bit extra. Uh, to all of our audiences, please thank me in joining, uh, join me in thanking, oh my goodness, join me in thanking Matt Miller and Matt Johnson for joining us, talking us about BlackBerry. Uh, and that concludes our video and podcast series for OFA 2023. We want to thank our sponsors as part of this show, uh, Film.ca Cinemas, of course, for hosting our festival, and EY and Ace Coworking for sponsoring this content today. Uh, we hope you join us for all of our excellent uh, venues and shows that we are doing in 2024. Our winter screening series begins on January 21st. We are so excited that you're getting, sorry, January 17th. We are so uh, excited to show you new movies in the new year, including International Women's Day, and our National Canadian Film Day program. And don't forget, we have the 2024 festival coming up June 20th to 26th this year. Uh, happy holidays. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, Johnson, thank you so much for being here and making the time to do this uh, with us today. We're so that grateful. It was a pleasure. To you. Thanks. Yeah, it was nice meeting you.